Namaskar and greetings to Natstrat Conversations. My name is Pankaj Saran. I am the convener of Natstrat. And in Natstrat Conversations, we bring you discussions and insights on geopolitics, on national security and technology with experts, scholars and practitioners. We hope you will like our shows and will you, you will follow us and promote our content. Today, we are going to discuss a topic which is relevant but has not been sufficiently analyzed and discussed. Religion and the role of religion in geopolitics. Sitting in the Indian subcontinent, religion and geopolitics is very closely associated with our history and our present. In fact, one could argue that the partition of India and the division of India was actually also the first statement of how Islam and the Indian Muslim League was used to create and to divide India. And thereafter, many, many things have happened. Similarly, in West Asia, in Southeast Asia, indeed, even in Europe, religion has always played historically a critical role in geopolitics. This is the lesson of history. And we hope to begin a new series on Nadstrat Conversations, which will dissect various dimensions of religion and geopolitics in the coming periods. And we will take individual subjects, individual regions, and talk to scholars about what is the influence of this on a country's geopolitics, a country's foreign policy, and how a country interacts with other countries. So we hope you will continue to join us and watch this space. Today, to begin this series, I have with me in the studio, Shah Faisal, who is a civil servant from India. He is a keen scholar and a watcher of Islam and of geopolitics all over the world. He needs little introduction. He was, uh, he was the topper of the Indian Administrative Service Examination in 2009. He actually is a medical doctor by education and by training before he joined the civil service. He holds a master's degree from Harvard University in public administration and policy management. And as I said, takes keen interest in political issues, in Islam and geopolitics. So we are very happy that he's here with us today. Welcome to the show, Faisal. And it's a delight to have you over. Thank you so much, sir. It's, it's such a pleasure to be here with you. So uh, since you are uh, from Kashmir, I want to begin by asking you, uh, tell us the experience you've had in Kashmir as a young boy, as a young student, now as a civil servant, and as someone who's actually taken a very keen interest in the intersection between Islam and geopolitics. And particularly tell us about, you know, obviously Kashmir has been one of the most uh, abused territories uh, in India because of cross-border terrorism and the use of uh, Islamic fundamentalism and radicalism and extremism. But things have changed after the abrogation of Article 370 on 5th August 2019. The situation seems to have changed radically and continues to change very fast. Tell me, uh, as someone who's from uh, Kashmir, uh, your own impressions about all these changes, um, not going too much into the past, but uh, how you read the situation today and uh, then we will take the conversation from there. Absolutely. I think uh, there is no gain saying to the fact that uh, a lot of things have changed in Kashmir since 2019. Uh, everybody has been talking a lot about how the security situation changed, particularly uh, the terrorism figures which we used to see earlier, uh, the law and order incidents, the stone pelting, the kind of uh, operations we had to go to eliminate militants there. I mean, all that is a matter of past now. Mm -hmm. We may not have to go much into the past. So even just four years, it seems yeah. like a lot has changed there. And this is unprecedented. because So we, the mood is uh, good in Kashmir today? It's very or positive. at least optimistic? It's very optimistic and it's visible on the ground. Mm -hmm. You can go and talk to any ordinary person in Kashmir. And you will see the kind of drastic change which has come in the lives of ordinary people. Yeah, I, I was told that uh, hotels are full, the tourism industry is booming. Those are obviously the dividends of peace. Yeah. Once uh, the perception of uh, security improves, automatically the people from outside want to come in. Correct. Because Kashmir always has had a certain brand value. Yeah. 
uh, as a very uh, unique, pristine destination, exactly. nestled in Himalayas. There has been a lot of history, a lot of culture associated with that place. Yeah. So I think the only obstacle which was there was the was the perception that something is not normal there. Yeah. And I think in the last three years we have uh, the country has very effectively succeeded in changing that perception. And uh, what what about what about governance and uh, governance both administrative, economic development, infrastructure development the streamlining of the education system, reopening of schools, colleges, uh, the mood among the youth. How's all that? Uh, is it going hand in hand with everything else? I think uh, on all these fronts, there has been a lot of uh, change, a lot of positive change has happened on one of the most important indicators, which uh, is a little bit interesting as well, which I keep talking about is the number of hartals which have been there in the last 30 years. So figures are around 2,000 2, to 2,500 days of hartals, which is effectively around six years the schools were closed in Kashmir from 1988 yeah. to 2019. And the most drastic um, and alternative statistic to that is that in last four years, there has not been a single hartal in Kashmir. Yeah, this is completely... Isn't that a completely dramatic... Dramatic. Dramatic change. Dramatic. Uh, similarly, we never had seen much of uh, foreign investment coming in. So those figures are going very much high. So some figures suggest that around 25,000 crores of foreign investment has been pledged mm -hmm. in last couple of years. Uh, we have yeah. seen tourism figures like which are unprecedented. Correct. Correct. And as you rightly said that the rooms are full. This year... Uh, being an officer from there, so a lot of people ask us for rooms. Can you please help us in booking a room in that hotel and the hotel and this hotel? It has been very difficult for us this yeah. year to yeah. help anybody. Well, so it's actually not an exaggeration to say that Kashmir has the potential of being the Switzerland of the East. It is indeed. And it has been, I think, traditionally people used to pitch it like that. Yeah. yeah. It is just that the cross-border terrorism, I mean, it totally altered everything there. Yeah. It didn't give Kashmir an opportunity to be seen in the world as such. So uh, when we talk of Kashmir, we also recall uh, the concepts of Kashmiriyat and Insaniyat and how uh, Islam as the dominant religion of Kashmir has been misused and exploited by extremist groups and uh, foreign ideologies. And the Sufi tradition of uh, the Kashmiri region was deliberately sought to be uh, discarded and to be overrun by the more militant forms and schools of Islam. Of course, also, uh, it's interesting before we discuss that to, uh, to actually acknowledge the fact that India is itself the host of both Deoband and Bareilly. And uh, these have been the fountainheads of, uh, of uh, the Tabliki Jamaat, of uh, the Deobandis, in fact, uh, Maulana Maududi also traces his origin he was from India. Uh, to India. Mm -hmm. But uh, over a period of time, uh, we have seen how the jamaat -e islami uh, how Wahhabism and uh, where the Diobandis fit in. And now, in the last few years, the radicalization of the Barelvis uh, has all uh, added to the complications and I would say perhaps uh, ideological confusion within the Islamic world. Recently, a few weeks ago, the Secretary General of the Saudi-based uh, World Muslim League, he had come here and repeatedly he talked about how he believed that all citizens, including Muslims, must adhere to the constitution of a country, which was actually a very significant statement because by saying that you must adhere to the constitution, you're actually saying that that is the supreme book and not the glory of God in terms of what perhaps is understood in the wider Islamic context of an ummah and uh, so on. And then, of course, you know, you saw in the uh, couple of a few decades ago, the rise of the ISIS and the Al-Qaeda and the pan-Islamic movement in the middle, in West Asia, starting from uh, maybe Tunisia and uh, parts of East Africa. Mm. And this whole talk of the Islamic Caliphate. And now, of course, you have the Taliban, which has uh, changed the name of the country mm -hmm. to the Islamic Emirate, Emirate of Afghanistan. And they rooted in, you know, Deobandi belief. Uh, they're a Sunni sect. So, since so much is happening in the Islamic world, but at the same time, you find also that 
the 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 focus and the edge that you had maybe a decade ago of you know this so called war against terror the war against islamic terror and the whole resurgence of isis al qaeda uh, in the levant in, in syria iraq and all seems to have abated so how do you uh, you know is there a thread common thread that you can draw on all these issues uh, because if you lay the foundations for some of these discussions as we go along in our series <laughs> where we plan to yeah. uh, subdivide each of these because there's so many yes. uh, aspects it will help uh, us to chart our way through this absolutely terrain. the spread of this problem is i mean it's cross continental it's transnational yeah. it's international obviously by all standards and um, sir as you rightly started with kashmir that kashmir was actually the frontier from which uh, we got introduced to the idea of political islam in the subcontinent possibly after maududi's uh, sayed abul ala maududi's mission actually started unfolding in pakistan uh, partition was there obviously we have spoken about that and uh, partition was possibly the first manifestation of how religion could possibly yeah. uh, to the extent be important in the political life of a, of, a, of the subcontinent but um, uh say mol madudi he started jamaat e islam in 1941 and initially he was not in favor of partition because the ideology which he belonged to that time also he did not believe that nationalism was something which the muslims should pursue hmm. i think that's one first important point which needs to be made that the political islam which 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 is all about the use of islam for political ends mm mm-hmm. so let's first start to understand that point yeah. i want to labor on that point a little sure, bit sure 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 that why is islam there in the first place so why should a faith be there in the first place if you look at how quran looks at it so from quranic perspective the islam or a deen or a religion it's fundamentally meant to answer the ontological or teleological questions of existence why is a man there in the first place where is he going what is the question right. of life and death right when it comes to the mundane and day to day secular affairs of life the historical understanding has been that islam is a very private affair mm-hmm. it doesn't have much to do with that mm-hmm. it may also come as a surprise to a lot of people that this default theocracy which we keep talking about that in islam there is no division between islam and the state yeah the the the, re- the religion and the state exactly that has also yeah. been questioned that in the first years of islamic uh, ev- evolution religion and state were actually separate mm-hmm. because if you if we go back a little bit back behind uh, we had this important incident of karbala which mm-hmm. had happened in which the prophet's grandchildren had been massacred and martyred mm-hmm. so because of that the the state that time the umayyad state the umayyad state and the religious clergy were at war mm-hmm. because there was no legitimacy to the umayyad state because there had been this massive incident where the prophet's grandchildren had yeah. been martyred yeah. Yeah. it took them a lot of time around 700 years to realize that how the state and ulama need to come together mm-hmm. and it was around 13, 12th and 13th century when this alliance started coming up again when islamic theocracy started taking shape mm. and then we zoom out and come back to maududi's time when partition happened and there is this person in egypt who comes about whose name is sayed qutb yeah. and he creates this militant idea of islam mm-hmm. and then um, sayed maududi he picks up from there comes brings it to south asia and kashmir becomes the first frontier for that mm-hmm. the first experimentation of political islam and its implementation basically happened in kashmir mm-hmm. once ziaul haq came into power in pakistan in 1977 right so he started this massive islamization process which then percolated automatically because kashmir was the natural choice for experimenting yeah. Yeah. with this new weapon which the pakistani deep state had got so they they used uh, the jamaat or the maududi uh, teachings to radicalize in a sense uh, the muslims of the subcontinent including indian muslims so one interesting thing happened that time in 1980 something important happened in kashmir it's mm-hmm. also a very unique factoid which i want to share sure which is that this important film came to be released which was known as the line of the desert a lot of people still watch it so mm-hmm. it was about this person called umar mukhtar mm-hmm. who uh, led the libyan resistance against italian armies mm-hmm. So this film is considered to be one of the turning points in development of Islamist consciousness in Kashmir. Mm-hmm. 
people started associating themselves with the idea of Umar Mukhtar, mm-hmm. who is fighting so-called an infidel uh, or a non-Islamic yeah. army there. Yeah. Yeah. So when 1977, uh, uh, Ziaul Haq thing happened, and in 1979, something drastic happened in the world, which 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 changed the world and which changed yeah. Kashmir forever. Yeah. Uh, the four incidents which we always yeah. keep talking about, about yeah. Iranian revolution, about attack on yeah. the Grand Mosque, yeah. uh, about uh, the, the, so the, the Islamist yeah. reforms in Pakistan. Yeah. So these imp- and the Soviet invasion. And the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. Yeah. So these four incidents brought a lot of new energy to Kashmir. Yeah. And Pakistan realized that, okay, what had happened in 1971? I think this is the time to get back. Correct. So what they couldn't do by military means, they did it mm. by ideological means. And the Kashmiriyat became the first casualty of that. But uh, now, uh, do you see, for example, the Muslim League, you know, which was uh, right at the center of Indian politics, uh, today has practically ceased to exist. Uh, you have uh, instead now uh, got uh, the Tablighi Jamaat, which is continuing. The Deobandi tradition is solid. It is based and rooted in history. And then you have the Maududi and the Wahhabism. And then, of course, the Muslim Brotherhood uh, in Egypt. So, uh, and then you have ISIS and Al-Qaeda. So, can you, uh, is it possible to break down these different strains of uh, interpretation uh, of Islam? Absolutely. Among the followers (laughs) and how it fits into... Uh, maybe India to begin with, and then we can talk about Afghanistan, Pakistan, Bangladesh. Uh, I think it's a very insanely complex uh, kind of uh, breakdown to happen because there is this entire spectrum which has subtle theological differences, yeah. subtle historical differences, subtle approach to religion and approach to modernity, approach to history, approach to state, and to which Islam differentiates itself. and to and, Islam itself. Yeah. So if we talk about like what would be one easier way to understand these movements. So one would be, for example, Jamaat Islami. So what, where do they stand? Jamaat Islami is basically an organization which believes in Hakimiyah. So this concept of Hakimiyah, which Sayyid Maududi gave, is very unique. He said the sovereignty belongs only to the God, Correct. to Allah, Correct. nobody else. So we want to establish a system where Sharia rules, simple. They don't believe in anything where there is no praxis. So they say that action is only about establishing the rule of God on the earth. And jihad is the sixth fundamental of the Islam. Mm. Shahada, mm. namaz, roza, zakat and hajj. Mm. These are the widely accepted five fundamentals of being in Islam. Mm. And political Islam which was founded by Maududi and Jamaat Islami, that is about the sixth that okay, you establish the hakimi of Allah. And jihad is the instrument to do that, which is the fifth, sixth fundamental. Farz on everybody. Mm. That is Jamaat Islami for you. Mm. Second is Tablighi Jamaat. Now, Jamaat Islami doesn't like Tablighi Jamaat. The mm. reason is very unique. Although on theological front, you will realize that these organizations are very similar. Yeah. But Tablighi Jamaat is very unique. It's also an Indian organization which was founded by India. Correct. In India. Correct. Correct. In the pre-British times. And the only difference is that Tablighi Jamaat is a quietist organization. They don't believe in establishing the political part of this. Mm-hmm. They also believe in the reformation of the society mm-hmm. from below downwards. They say, let us change the individual first. Mm-hmm. He must become pious and a true Muslim. Mm-hmm. Only then the society will change. Mm-hmm. But Jamaat Islami believes that no, we have to, we need a resur- insurrection. We need a revolutionary form of thing. Mm-hmm. So that the, the, the Hakimiya of Allah can be established. So these are these two. Third, then we come to Deobandi and ISIS. Mm-hmm. Now it's a very unique thing that Taliban follow the Deobandi strain of mm-hmm. school of thought. Mm-hmm. Now Deobandis are very uniquely positioned. They say, Deobandis say that, okay, once Prophet Muhammad Wasallam came and he, you know, the Quran came and the Hadith came. So the the way Islam has to be practiced and the way Islam is to be seen, it is to be based on Quran and Hadith. So those people who talk about Quran and Hadith only, they say whatever happened after that, we don't recognize that. Yeah. So you, we call them Salafia. Correct. So Salafia Correct. and Wahhabia becomes one group Correct. which say that let's go to Salafis, which is like we go to the ancients. Mm. The first ones, mm. the, Khali, the, the, the Prophet and his uh, rightful companions. Mm. But the Deobandi school is a very unique one. Mm-hmm. So they are saying that no, but between 7th and 8th century and 9th century, 
we had these great jurists mm. who reinterpreted the scriptures and made it easy for us mm. and from which four important madhabs or schools came about mm. hanafi school shafi school yeah. maliki school and one more hanbali mm. so they say that no one of these schools you have to obey mm. you cannot go far to the salafi level it's a very unique theological position which they take and they say that okay whatever has been said by them you at you ascribe to one of these schools and that's it Yeah. and beyond that the hubindis also say that the, there is no possibility of reinterpretation of religion beyond that time so in the in the historically speaking in the last few decades of, of contemporary history which of the two uh, seems to be capturing the imagination of the followers is it the the hubindi approach or is it the maududi approach or is it the wahhabism which has come to us it is i think original Saudis. also i think if you look at the post 1973 world mm. when the uh, the war happened in the arab peninsula against israel and after that the yom kippur and other things which happened after 67 and 1973 and then the oil shock happened in yeah. 1973 yeah. so there was this sudden resurgence of the salafi islam mm. wahhabi salafi doctrine yeah. so for many years across the world Wahhabi Salafi was the most dominant doctrine which started to spread and it was bankrolled by a lot of money it was bankrolled by the oil money obviously there's no doubt money. in that yeah. yeah so the official uh, kind of strain of Saudi Islam it became the official strain which had to be exported across the world but now with this uh, winds of change in Saudi Arabia so now the Salafi and this Islam which was kind of it was an interpretation it was not a form of Islam basically that is on the by, by, that's on the retreat so the vision which has been given by mbs the vision 2030 that has put a break on this it's very yeah. unusual we are at such a moment in history where what has been happened what has been done in 30 years the same people are trying to undo it because they have realized the kind of monster that it is the kind so of damage is, it has uh, done across the world extraordinary this is actually a silent revolution uh, in the in our in, in front of our eyes in 19 early 90s there is this scholar called asif bayat he asabiyat he predicted a phase of post islamism mm-hmm. he said the time for this islamism the jamaluddin afghani islamism and then maududi islamism and then salafi islamism is 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 going to be over very soon and it came to be it came to a very drastic end in recent years we saw how islamic state the kind of end it met yes there was a time when it had recruited millions of people and okay. the islamic state ideology is the ex- most extreme form of ideology so extreme that al qaeda calls itself the left of left mm. of uh, islamic state mm. compared to the islamic state al qaeda comes across as a moderate organization so would you say that the 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 us actions uh, in um, iraq in libya and syria uh, etc and the way turkey also joined in uh, etc has contributed to the retreat of uh, the islamic state and al qaeda obviously i think with most of the top leadership of islamic state dead yeah including abu bakr al baghdadi and his yeah. also his successor islamic state the kind of expansion and the kind of uh, the kind of attraction it had among the young muslims mm-hmm. across the world mm-hmm. it was unprecedented because the kind of brutality there was this unique thing about abu bakr al baghdadi because he he traced his ancestry to the quraish which mm-hmm. was the prophet strike and he said i am the rightfully appointed khalifa if you remember his speech in which he gave in the most first speech in mosul mosque he said that time that you know that these are the attributes of a khalifa and i declare myself to be a khalifa and anybody who does not accept my bayat and doesn't accept me as a khalifa is a kafir in fact the fundamental difference that started that time between al qaeda and islamic state was this al qaeda said that you are being too extreme by asking yeah. people that they need to be killed Yeah. but islamic states decline which happened from 2014 onwards this time we are witnessing it's a very surprising thing that islamic state is experiencing a resurgence in some parts of africa really yeah it is very it's unbelievable because there is a mm. lot of state instability happening in mali yeah. in some other parts of west africa so because of that it is resurging there we have also sta- seen islamic state of khurasan pakistan which is mm. giving a tough competition to taliban yeah. in afghanistan yeah. we'll come to that a little later but just to go back a little bit on yeah. the west asians theater and uh, say north africa etc you know one of the things which uh, egypt under sadat and mubarak and now under sisi has done 
is to actually completely clamp down on the Muslim, the Brotherhood, Muslim Brotherhood, right? And they've done it for 20, 30, 40 years. You know, the Hassan al-Banna and exactly. his, that entire ideology, they resurfaced briefly under Mohammed Morsi and then they were crushed. So has that had, a, uh, what kind of an impact has that had on the Saudi school of Islam? And also on the terror that used to emanate from the Palestinian territories, from the Hamas and so on, because all this had a multiplier effect. Absolutely. It was spread across and then people in the subcontinent would watch and that's when I think the Diobandis and others and the Tablikis uh, felt that uh, the agenda was being hijacked Absolutely. by that whole region because those scholars were better funded, were more vocal and the West actually looked only at them. Mm -hmm. They never regarded the Indian Islamic school of thought as deserving of independent study. I think uh, one of the unique case studies of this Islamic uh, extremism is Egypt, as you rightly said, that this entire movement starts and with Hassan al-Banna in 1928 starts in Egypt. Yeah. And then Said Qutb is also there. And yeah. then the, um, you have assassination of a president happening there. Exactly. But still in 40 to 50 years of time, Muslim Brotherhood doesn't get to rule even once. Exactly. Apart from uh, the, that short period sure. in 2011 when Morsi came in. Yeah. Uh, that is, I think, Egypt has been successfully able to contain the Muslim Brotherhood there. Mm -hmm. Although the kind of threat which Muslim Brotherhood uh, posed to the rest of the world, it was tremendous and phenomenal. But the kind of approach which Egypt showed towards Muslim Brotherhood, that's very exemplary in that and sense. There were divisions because Jordan Muslim uh, is uh, Muslim Brotherhood is recognized in Jordan and maybe one or two other countries. So even within the Arab world, the world there was a lot of division on that because I mean, you Muslim Brotherhood pitched itself as a political party. Yeah, that's a very unique thing about them. Yeah. And Muslim Brotherhood also has through its various uh, kind of uh, statements and others, they have denounced violence. Yeah, Muslim Brotherhood actually used to be thought of as some sort of a moderate organization because Hassan al-Banna's strain or original thought process was not as militant as Sayyid Qutb. Mm -hmm. Hassan al-Banna had not conceived of Muslim Brotherhood or Iqbal al-Muslimon as a jihadi organization. Mm -hmm. It was basically a mainstream Islamist organization that we will implement Islamism, the Sharia, but through mainstream means. We'll also yeah. participate in elections. Yeah. So their position was very unique. Yeah, so they were not rejectionists. They were not rejectionists and there was no idea of takfir in that. They did not actually have campaigns against the Shias and Ahmadis and other Yazidis and other non-Muslim yeah. heretical as so-called heretical sects. But you know, I've always heard uh, frequently this possibility of uh, ideological and theological collaboration uh, and cooperation, let's say between Dioband and Al-Azhar University in uh, Cairo. I don't know, is that a natural fit? Uh, do they complement each other or they compete? They do at, at certain points of time, although there has been a lot of competition between yeah. the two universities, they don't actually see much of uh, uh, harmony on many issues. Mm -hmm. There are definitely a lot of theological debates where uh, Deoband has a totally different stance. I told you because Deoband uh, believes in taqlid, it believes in uh, the Islamic fiqh in the four madahib important mm -hmm. schools of thought. Mm -hmm. So the entire world was uh, driven by that. Mm -hmm. That's why if you look at Taliban, I mean, Taliban has been constantly at war with the Islamic State of uh, yes. Khorasan and Pakistan, which is unbelievable otherwise. It, it, that mm -hmm. means a direct confrontation between Deobandi and a Salafi jihadi sect. Yeah. So Deobandis and Salafis actually come into clash in Afghanistan. The reason mm -hmm. for that is uh, Islamic State believes in the transnational version of Islam, that Islam has to be enforced across the world. Mm -hmm. There are no national boundaries to be accepted mm -hmm. and there is no mercy to be given to the to the non-Muslim minorities. Yeah. But uh, I have they, heard... Taliban believes otherwise. They mm -hmm. believe that, okay, they still respect the national boundaries. That, okay, we mm -hmm. also, uh, the, the, the idea, the difference between Emirate and the Caliphate. Yeah, correct. That's right. That's a very crucial difference. No, no, that's right. The Emirate and the Caliphate. These are two crucial, this is a very yeah. crucial distinction yeah. which needs to be made. But I was uh, told that the Taliban is actually in the process of uh, drafting a new constitution for Afghanistan and I've heard that they are roping in Indonesian scholars and uh, the question is whether, for example, uh, the Diobandis can be roped in or contribute to the drafting of such a constitution. These uh, Taliban is already like in the grips of the Diobandi ideology mm -hmm. because they follow it to the letter and spirit. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to Indonesia, I think Indonesia is something if actually Talibanis want to learn from Indonesia, that's going to be, I mean, that's yeah. like calling day and night. Yeah. Because Indonesian Islam is a completely different, 
you spoke about indian islam before yes it's ironic that we have not been able to project indian islam as an alternative yes to the west asian or to the salafist islam the way islam nusantra indonesia came up with a very unique term they call it the archipelagic islam or the islam nusantra they say we have a very unique experience where our local custom our local history it informs our practice of islam but more than them it was basically the indian islam so i think one of the important implications of what is happening around is that the way islam used to come from the west and the interpretations would come from the western side by west i mean like our western neighbors from pakistan iran afghanistan and the west asia and the central asia and the middle east now it is the time that islam also you know the, the right interpretations of islam go from our side to that side well, that's a that's a big point you're making which is that the time probably has come to assert the indian islamic uh, ideology and the vision of the world which is syncretic which is uh, by definition uh, accepting of other faiths lives in a multicultural multi faith uh, environment respects the political constitution and uh, maybe that voice the time has come for that voice to be heard and to be much louder than it has been so far otherwise you become you are at the mercy of uh, other interpretations in 2024 it is going to be the 100th year of the abolition of the caliphate mm-hmm. in turkey 1924 2024 this is a very crucial mo- moment i think in the islamic world which in in this moment i think there is one introspection which needs to be done it is that the muslim world needs to look at the experience of last 100 years what has worked and what hasn't worked mm-hmm. definitely what hasn't worked is that the ideology the political islam the extremist interpretations of islam have not worked yeah I think this is the moment when now the original Islamic lads can possibly learn. So there is this dis- dif- this distinction between Arab and Ajam. Arab means Arabic lands. Ajam and would mean the places like ours. Yeah. So it's possibly for time now to learn from the cultural and religious and the faith experience of the peripheral Islamic lands. Yeah, exactly. I think it's now exactly. the time for Indonesian lands, Indonesian yeah. Islam. indian subcontinent islam to go back and inform the islamic experience in the rest of the world that you have never been able to be at peace but in last the, uh, 70 years but the question is can let's say the indian schools of islam starting with deoband and the tablighis etc are they capable of reinventing themselves the whole madrasa system of education uh, islamic scholarship Uh, do you see any signs of modernization within I think india the and tablighi schools of thought have not been uh, well informed or they have not been grounded in the islamic experience that india uniquely has i want to make that point i a little bit differ with the way it is understood uh, islamic experience is an individual or it's a collective conscious mm-hmm. experience of the people Mm-hmm. which has not nothing possibly to do with the organized schools mm-hmm. of thought mm-hmm. it has not nothing to do with the madrasa system that's in vogue at the moment mm-hmm. actually the obandi schools of thought and the tablighi school of thought they may call the indian system of or indian experience of islam as a heretical or a deviant form of islam mm-hmm. it's 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 actually the mainstream the mass practiced uh, experience of islam which is which the masses in india actually practice without even knowing which school yeah. do they belong to correct it's this unconscious memory which they have had of correct. centuries of uh, you know intermixing with various faiths correct. and various cultures correct i think correct. that is beyond and that's outside mm. the presence of these madrasas well, that is something which needs to be presently i don't see there is any organized effort to promote that mm. because that's very organic and that's so scattered in the yeah, system and and uh, and it has so many geographical variations it is so heterodox it is so heterogeneous it's so distributed widely and it's organic i mean you just don't know who is there is no papacy in that there is no clergy yeah, clergy in absolutely, that absolutely. there is there are no imams who are trained in that way it is just it's out there yeah the way islam nusantra has now what they have done is that they have this organization called nahdatul ulama so nahdatul ulama is a is an organization of ulama who actually promote this 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 uh strain of islam which is based on the indonesian experience of panchshila mm. we don't have any such thing yeah. yeah we don't have any school of thought we don't have any university which is dedicated to teaching the indian spiritual 
or indian sufi tradition of islam to yeah. rest of the world yeah. i think that's where we are missing yeah. i think uh, a lot of uh, this action uh, can actually take place uh, tomorrow in kashmir i mean it is it could become the turning point in how uh, the rest of the indian muslims view kashmir and what kind of an example kashmir sets for the rest of the 200 million i think that's an important point to maybe go back to we can and, go and back close that uh, on that that yeah. uh, kashmir the way kashmir experienced terrorism for 30 years and the terrorism was obviously rooted in first there was uh, indoctrination there was the intel a certain intellectual tradition came in which was very violent which was very exclusivist which was very militant and that then became a forerunner for the militancy and the militancy 30 years people saw it i think now in kashmir also there are a lot of conversations about going back to the kashmiri way of life or kashmiri as you rightly kashmiri. introduced in the beginning the and sufi uh, islam the syncretic form of it and i am not sure i mean can kashmiris immediately reject the interpretations of religion which are based on very rigid doctrines and which are very based on something which is not ours but i'm sure there is a lot of rethinking happening on that mm. people are actually introspecting that what we lost and you know probably the best thing uh, from this point of view is in a sense uh, what they are seeing across the border which is basically the collapse of a state that was born on the basis of religion and where the jamaat e islami really prospered as you said from 1977 and how polit- and it came, probably became the capital of political islam in the world absolutely and that- today the the kind of implosion uh, of that state is there to see for everyone who watches Uh, and so that i think is a good uh, warning signal absolutely that i if think if you don't correct your ways if you don't correct your way you also look at the implications that it has it doesn't give you a strong state it it destroys the state capability because what it happens it leads into a semi or a full on civil war situation yeah. in pakistan what is happening presently is that sunnis are fighting shias and now barelvis are fighting deobandis now you have ttp which is fighting the rest you had your own organizations like lashkar e taiba J- the jaish e mohammed now they are fighting each other now you have sipahi sahaba which was an organization to kill shias so everybody is killing everybody and now you have this latest movement which is uh, in which which is about blasphemy that you are out to kill anybody who says even smallest thing about religion or about prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and you are killing christians you are killing ahmadis you are mo- taking them away from their homes i mean this is like a mad house presently no and, uh, and the, this tells us what ideology can possibly do and uh, the, i mean i think we are seeing the extremes of extremism in pakistan and that is that's for kashmiris also to see at the moment and the sharp rhetoric between the taliban in afghanistan and the pakistan establishment when you are this is unbelievable that I mean, means i mean sirajuddin haqqani is actually talking as you know someone who's been uh, brought up in pakistan his language against pakistan is incredible because this concept of takfir again comes in that they are mm-hmm. saying that pakistan is not an islamic state it is not being run on the principles of sharia mm-hmm. it is an apostate state so the war against an apostate state becomes a fard yeah so the jihad which was conceived to be against others now becomes your own liability so the next subject for discussion is going to be bangladesh <laughs> which we haven't touched upon i think yeah we missed on bangladesh but we need to have a separate uh, discussion because yeah. that is where now the jamaat is really and the hifazat islam mm. are really trying to make a comeback Absolutely. and the jamaat history of bangladesh and the creation of bangladesh and their role during east pakistan is another uh, story i think it's a crucial thing yeah. it's a crucial yeah. development happening on the eastern borders yeah. and it is definitely going to have a lot of uh, security implications for the country that's obviously a topic for for discussion for discussion thank you very much uh, faisal for thank you so uh, much sir it's been with us and thank for you. your very very insightful thank views you. Thank you so much viewers for being with us on this episode as you can see this is a topic which we can discuss over many many sessions because it is complicated but it is critical to national security and the understanding of the world we live in thank you very much for joining us and till we meet again goodbye